Uh, but I'm delighted to be here and to be speaking at this celebration of Maxime. Uh, well, I've known Maxime for many years, and uh, I remember once we were having some mathematical conversation, and uh, it's pretty complicated, and uh, so I was wondering, well, how did you think of this? How, how do you know this? And Maxime said, oh, of course, but there's gravity. Remember that? Gravity. <laughs> and so that was it. <laughs> And um, uh, so I've learned a lot of mathematics from Maxim over the years, and uh, it's always very inspirational. And uh, uh, you know, some of my talk will be about uh, you know, ideas maybe from physics uh, and how they uh, are perhaps useful in arithmetic. And anyway, so we're talking about K3 surfaces and, uh, well, algebraic K3 surfaces, giving well, Break equations uh, and uh, labeled by uh, even positive integers, uh, degree. Degree 2 K3 are so double covers of P2, ramified and a sextic, uh, a quartic in P3, the most famous one perhaps, intersection of three quadrics, or a Kummer surface, blow up of uh, you know, the fixed points on a beginning surface when you quotient by the involution, x goes to minus x, a Kummer surface. So here is uh, a page from Klein Protocols uh, from 1876. A student of Klein uh, made models of uh, you know, K3 surfaces, Kummer surfaces, and nach den Zeichnungen von Professor Klein. So Klein you know, made technical drawings for that. And then there is here das Modell here. Uh, and, um, Mm, Klein himself gave lectures in his own seminar on uh, uh, Kummer surfaces. Here we are uh, reading about uh, you know, Kummer surfaces and the connection to hyperelliptic functions. Perhaps a reference to the abelian surface that we've seen before. Now, so why are we thinking about K3s? Uh, well, first of all, there's fascinating geometry, and usually one talks about uh, Kummer, Kähler, and Kodaira. And uh, uh, people are wondering why K3, why K and I have an explanation here in 1882. Uh, again, Klein, his own handwriting. Here we see K dot, well, I interpret this as a three. <laughs> and then there's another one, K dot uh, something. In any event, uh, uh, there is a reference to Andre Vales that has something to do with some mountains somewhere, but I don't believe that. In any way, there, is, there are also interesting connections to, well, string theory, mirror symmetry, mathematical physics, perhaps our universe has something to do with K3s, I don't know. There are connections to interesting groups, monster groups. Uh, and uh, just to begin, just to warm up, uh, uh, so you know, curve counting came up in uh, mirror symmetry, and it's quite fascinating. You write down some generating function. Uh, this growing coefficients, rapidly growing coefficients, and this is supposed to count uh, rational curves on a K3 surface. This famous formula by Yao Zaslov was established uh, over the years, and uh, that curve count is supposed to be connected with, well, maybe something in the mirror world, and I don't know really about mirrors, but if you have an algebraic K3, which is general, so rank picar one, uh, well, then the mirror thing, at least I can read what it is. It's a, there is a one parameter family of dual K3s, which uh, are of the form, you know, one elliptic curve times another by an evolution, so a Kummer case. In fact, the quotient of the mirror by some evolution is this Kummer case. Now, uh, another uh, interesting thing maybe to note, uh, well, there is something called the elliptic geni genus, a function of two complex variables, but when you evaluate in zero, you get the other characteristic. Well, that's kind of amazing. But then, if you expand this function uh, into something, and you see coefficients showing up, then suddenly these are dimensions of reducible representations of this uh, monster group there, and uh, the subsequent coefficients are sums of such dimensions. So, sorry? Yeah, yes, okay, material. Now, uh, I 
I got this paper from Iguchi, uh, uh, Oguri, and Tashikawa as a submission to the Journal of Experimental Mathematics. I was one of, I'm still one of the editors, and I was really you know, stunned that you know, something like this can, can happen. And this was established recently um, by you know, actually several groups of people, uh, independent publications. So it's a theorem. Uh, and uh, while well, that particular group has something to do with another group and sort of an algebraic geometry, uh, Mukai established that you know, if you have symplectic automorphisms, then uh, in fact, well, of a K3, they are embedded into this M23. Now, uh, so this is all uh, you know, on the sort of geometry side. The main questions for us. Uh, we work over non-closed fields, like finite fields, number fields, or, or, or functional fields of a curve. And uh, uh, the kind of questions that we want to ask are, well, are there rational curves or rational points? And when they are, well, are they dense, maybe in the risky topology or in some other topologies, perhaps potentially dense after finite extensions of the ground field? So, and what I'd like to do today is to uh, survey some ideas and techniques in this area of arithmetic geometry. And some of those techniques are inspired actually by developments in mirror symmetry and some high dimensional algebraic geometries. All right. Uh, so, first of all, let's start with a simple example. So, uh, uh, there is this particular diagonal uh, quartic, uh, and there was a conjecture of Euler that there are no non-trivial solutions. So trivial would be you know, 0, 0, and 1, 1. And uh, that was uh, disproved by Elkis. He produ produced infinitely many solutions over the rationals. Uh, and then there was another conjecture, more recent, by uh, certain Dyer, actually, that this particular diagonal quartic has uh, no non-trivial solutions. And here, trivial would be, again, 0, 0, and you know, 1, minus 1, 1, 1. And uh, well, when it came out, so it was sort of natural to try to disprove it. That my postdocs in Göttingen, graduate students, uh, ran a computer and found that there is actually a non-trivial solution. And here is a solution. And then, well, they had to do a lot of work because what do you do? I mean, it's, you can't do approximations. It's really integers. So you have to try integers, you know, from here to there, from say minus 100,000 to minus a million to plus a million and see what happens. And it takes a lot of time. They had to reprogram basic arithmetic for that. In any event, they found no other solutions up to 100 million in size. So we don't know, are there infinitely many solutions? Are there only these two, or these, you know, the ones obtained by changing signs, and so on. So in other words, the arithmetic of case threes you know, is, is hard, even sort of computationally. Now, uh, so what kind of geometric invariance will be relevant? So we have a polarized K3, uh, and uh, well, we have its Picard lattice, and it sits in you know, H2, and so this is what we have, uh, some distinguished lattice. And, uh, uh, well, the Picard rank, uh, the Picard group is just you know, z to the rho, and the rho, it can vary from 1 to 20 for fields of characteristic 0, but over FP bar, we are not allowed odd numbers. We're only allowed even ones, but we can go up to 22. So this is a basic invariant. And so we have an intersection form on Picard, and we can learn uh, you know, geometric information from uh, looking at this form. For example, if in this lattice, in the Picard lattice, we have a class of square 0, well, then we have an elliptic vibration. And then we can use it to you know, prove something arithmetic. Now, how do we compute this Picard lattice in practice? So, uh, or even that number, even the rank. So for FP bar, uh, we can do this by uh, simply counting points over finite fields, computing the has availed at the function, and we can do brute force. We can just plug in uh, you know, numbers from 0 to p. And, and uh, in any event, we have to do this computation uh, because h2 has rank 22, we have to go to sort of the middle. In the principle, we have to go up to p to the 11. So p to the 11, and if you have, you know, let's say four variables, so the you know, straightforward brute force algorithm would require you know, p to the 11, and then you know, p to the 33, maybe. Or you know, at best, maybe. In any event, it's not practical for primes bigger than 10. 
And in fact, you know, some paper from two years ago said, well, for p equals seven, it took two days of computer time to compute just that. So, however, there are um, you know, improvements. You don't have to do brute force. Uh, Kidlaya has developed an algorithm, um, and uh, Antoine Chamberlain explained it in the Bourbaki talk several years ago, how to rapidly compute uh, points. And, uh, um, well, it is better than uh, what I wrote here. Now, over Q bar, uh, there are some ad hoc methods. Uh, if, by you know, miracle, if we have a case three where in one prime uh, we have rank Picard two, in the other prime over P2 bar we have rank Picard two, but the discriminants of those uh, don't uh, match modulus squares, well, then uh, you are forced to have Picard one because of these compatibilities of lattices. So sometimes you can just find examples uh, where, you know, what one prime of this, that, and, and Van Luyck has produced infinitely many examples of K3s of the rationals, quartic K3s with rank Picard 1, uh, geometric rank Picard 1. Now, uh, uh, so Andrew uh, Crash and, you know, Brandon Hassett and I, uh, we were thinking about this computability issue of 4K3s, and uh, we proved there is an algorithm with a priori bounded running time to compute uh, rank Picard and actually all the generators. So, uh, well, and at this stage you can only do it in degree two. So, so what's involved? Uh, well, we needed an effective version of Kuga's attacker correspondence, well, and the other uh, you know, effective versions of techniques and algebraic geometry, effective geometric invariance theory, Masarvus holds effective state conjecture and so on. So, uh, and the main issue, sort of what's the main problem uh, in extending this uh, from degree two to other degrees, for example, to cortex, is um, an effective construction of uh, um, certain arithmetic quotients, uh, um, namely quotients of bounded symmetric domains by you know, discrete groups. Uh, well, it is known by a general theorem of uh, Bailey Borel that these are quasi projective algebraic varieties. But uh, uh, what we need is, in fact, equations for these varieties, effective equations. Now, there are some instances where this is known. So, the Mumford's uh, you know, lectures on theta functions, Mumford does it for moduli of abelian varieties in all dimensions. And we need something similar for moduli of K3s. And degree two is very special because in this case, it so happens that that corresponding, you know, moduli space, well, you can construct it via GIT, and that quotient on the nose is exactly this D mod gamma in this degree. And there are, you know, similar things in higher degrees, but they require some further factorizations, and um, we are not able to push it through. So in other words, we need some effective bound on the generators of rings of automorphic functions, if you like, um, on degrees of these generators. Uh, but given that, we can proceed and bound, uh, you know, compute the Picard rings. Now, compute, again, so what does it mean? As you can imagine, you know, with all the words on the slide, GIT, you know, Kuga Sataka, uh, AK3 surface, you know, gets associated with an abelian variety of dimension two to the 19. How do you compute anything on an abelian variety of dimension two to the 19? But you see in arithmetic geometry, there are results like this. So in Baker's theorem, for example, in transcendence theory, you have an equation, you have a priori bounds, the bounds are very large, but uh, you know, you plug it into something else and it's becoming useful later. Okay, so, um, um, so once we know, let's say we know the Picard group, so we can you know, try to explore some more geometry, what about rational curves? Uh, well, there is a theorem that every projective K3 has at least one rational curve. And uh, well, very general such surfaces contain infinitely many rational curves. Now, over number fields, uh, uh, well, number fields are countable and the coefficients and you know, all of this is countable and very general could exclude all the surfaces defined over your number field. So it would be important in number theory to know that, well, K3s over number fields have curves, many curves. And I mentioned previously that there is a formula that counts curves or, you know, sup supposed to be curves, 
But unfortunately, and the formula involves coefficients. You know, there is a dn, and those d coefficients grow very fast. But the formula does not prove uh, that there are infinitely many curves, unfortunately. And so um, there are some special case reasons for which uh, existence of rational curves can be established you know, directly. And those are elliptic ones, and those with infinite automorphisms. But uh, we have to have uh, uh, Picards of higher rank. For an elliptic one, we have to represent 0. So we have to have rank at least 2. And similarly, for automorphisms, we have to have higher rank Picard. In particular, rank Picard 1, we don't know what to do. And uh, uh, in the Kummer case, uh, over a finite field, uh, there is actually uh, you know, the following theorem, which when we found it, you know, was quite striking to us. So if you look at the Kummer surface over a finite field and pick any number of algebraic points, so points over FP bar, that are not on those 16 exceptional curves, then you can find infinitely many geometrically reducible rational curves which are defined over the ground field, over your small finite field, that pass through these points. I mean, this is some kind of version of space filling curves. So in other words, uh, well, so you produce many, many rational curves that you know, even pass through prescribed points. Uh, so, so here was this joint theorem with Bogomolov and Brandon Hassett that again, in degree two, uh, in rank Picard one, we could prove that the K3, uh, you know, any K3 uh, of degree two has infinitely many rational curves. Here I wrote number field. In fact, any field of characteristic zero would work. Uh, so what is involved? Well, in the original argument of, uh, let's say, Mori Mukai, proving that K3s have rational curves, one starts with a special K3 and then tries to move the curves, the rational curves, sort of in a family, and then specialize, and rational curves specialize to rational curves. So that guarantees the existence of some rational curves in the specialization. But unfortunately, in that specialization, of course, uh, you, you know, many curves could collapse onto one curve, and then you don't know that you have infinitely many. And here, uh, we use sort of a mixed characteristic version of that. Well, we looked at a K3 over a number field, and then we reduced mod various primes. And the reduction modular primes was you know, the special case. We know that an FP bar rank Picard is at least 2. And in rank Picard 2, we have a chance of finding new rational curves. And then we would try to lift them to characteristic zero. Uh, and that idea worked. Sorry. Um, but uh, to uh, sort of control the deformation theory and all that's needed, well, first we needed rational curves, which, you know, a chain of rational curves. And then, of course, we had to make sure that the sum of those curves, the class, is a multiple of the polarization, the only class that we have at hand in rank Picard 1, so that we're able to lift. And uh, you know, one of the issues we had was transversality for and also center sections. We can't control that. We don't know what the curves are. But uh, if all the coefficients were 1, then we succeeded. And in degree 2, again, by accident, we were able to produce chains of rational curves like this, where the coefficients were all coefficients were 1. Uh, so subsequently, Lee and Litke uh, proved a much more general theorem that if you have a case 3 of odd Picard rank, then uh, there are infinitely many rational curves. And uh, again, they used reduction mod p, but uh, uh, they had another idea, well, that used, uh, in fact, conservative spaces, uh, rigid stable maps, and, uh, well, combined with uh, what we did prior to that, um, they were able to um, produce infinitely many rational curves. Now, what is the problem? What is left? What's left is uh, rank Picard 2. You see, not every K3 of rank Picard 2 has an elliptic vibration or infinite automorphism. So there are some cases where the problem is still open. And uh, I, the main issue is, well, how do we know the rank Picard jumps when we reduce modular various primes? So I, there is nothing that you know, guarantees with jumping behavior. If we had that at, for infinitely many primes, then we could, you know, start the previous machine. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the jumping of Picard rings of K3s. Well, 
Uh, so we already know that if you rank the car one and we reduce mod p and look at fp bar, we have to have at least two. So there is some number here, it only depends on the k3, uh, that uh, you have to add uh, automatically. Well, that function eta, it, you know, if you have complex multiplication, real multiplication, there is something that you can you know, specify. And jumping would mean that you have uh, strict inequality here. Now, equality does actually happen for infinitely many primes. And in fact, after some finite extension of the ground field, even for density one of primes. So the jumping behavior is going to be a rare event. But nevertheless, you want to know, does it happen? Is the set infinite, for example? So, uh, and again, the main concern for us would be rank Picard 2. Well, not knowing what to do in rank Picard 2, let's look at the Kummer case, uh, where rank Picard is at least 17. Uh, so the rank Picard of a Kummer surface is, well, the 16 exceptional curves that we had. And then, of course, the rank Picard of the abelian surface, well, it could be 1. But in fact, if the abelian surface is a product of two elliptic curves, well, then you're guaranteed to have at least 18. And if those curves are exogenous, then it's at least 19. Well, and if in addition they have complex multiplication, well, then uh, you're at least 20. And so now we can look at the jumping behavior in this case. All right. So when are we jumping? Well, if you have exogenous curves, then we are jumping if and only if LP is a prime of super singular reduction, actually. Well, maybe. So, uh, and so does that happen? And the theorem of Elkis from 87 says that there are infinitely many such primes. So there is a recent uh, 2013 theorem of Francois Charles, I mean, I heard his talk in New York just a month ago or so, uh, that even when the curves are not isogenous, uh, the set of jumping primes is infinite. Um, and there is no paper yet, but you know, it looked totally convincing. Now, if the abelian surface is absolutely simple, on the other hand, then we don't, we don't know. Well, not knowing this, uh, I, I asked uh, my student at NYU to compute those ranks and compute the jumping behavior. So he implemented this uh, algorithm of uh, Kedlaya that developed for hyperliptic curves in the case of uh, quartic surfaces that allowed him to go from primes less than 10 to primes less than 100,000, which is significant enough to actually produce some uh, you know, statistically significant data. So what are we seeing here? Well, in the first slide, we're seeing you know, some examples, example one, example two, of k 3 is geometric Picard number one. And so we are guaranteed to have two. But the question is, do we have four? And we're counting primes up to x and dividing by you know, you know, x log I over log x, the number of primes up to x. And this is what we're seeing. Uh, essentially, one over square root of uh, b. Well, it's not quite square root. If it's 4, 4 here and 4, 4, four 2 maybe here. But, uh, well, those are the data, and that's the line that's supposed to give the square root. Now, if you're on geometric rank Picard 2, on the other hand, in those examples, well, we're supposed to look at primes jumping to 4. And we are seeing uh, the number of those primes. And it's essentially half the primes. Well, it's not really half. Now, you could think that, well, maybe it's you know, complex multiplication or something like this, and maybe you know, field splitting or non-splitting of primes and some quadratic extensions, so half the primes split, half the primes don't split. But uh, it's not the case, actually. And as we can see, there is no oscillation around 1 half. We are, we are going to 1 half sort of from above. We are not you know, really getting 1 half. So it would be nice to have some, some heuristic explanation in all cases of um, you know, what is the asymptotic of jumping primes uh, for uh, K3 surfaces. And there's probably involve um, you know, maybe the Sato-Tate group. You know, some combination of Sato-Tate and Langtrotter should give it. So here are some other examples. For example, rank 16. And again, you're seeing you know, 0.56, if you like. And uh, here is rank 17. And then we are seeing, you know, b to the 4, 2 and b to the 4, 6. Uh, so that's what the computer tells us here. Now, uh, so we understand rational curves uh, and, you know, maybe the jumping behavior of primes. Let's think about rational points. 
And the question is, we have a K3 surface over some non-closed field. Are rational points dense after some finite extension of the ground field? And we looked at uh, the two cases, the number theoretic setup, where you know, we're working over the rationals, and also the geometric setup, we're working over a function field of a curve. And so here is uh, sort of the situation that if you have a general pencil of uh, K3 surfaces over P1, then actually uh, rational points are the risky dense. But here general really means general, sort of complement to countable subset of things. And so at this stage we are unable to uh, overcome this. And over number fields, it's sort of the opposite case. If you look at special ones, you know, you know elliptic, K3s or those with infinite automorphisms, then again we have you know, potentially dense sets of rational points. And so let me just very briefly say, what are the problems? So in the first case, we need to know that the jumping primes, if you like, uh, they're not too jumping. We need to ensure that rank Picard is exactly two for infinitely many points on the base, for infinitely many primes, two and not more. Now, if you again think about the moduli spaces situation, so we have family of K3s, so it's like a curve in the moduli space of K3s, so an algebraic curve, right, P1, all right? And so what we need to make sure is that this curve does not intersect several Brill-Neuter divisors. It's, a, it's supposed to intersect just one, but not two simultaneously. So now when you look at it like this and uh, you, know, you pull back the curve before the quotient by gamma, this really looks like some version of Andre Ward conjecture maybe and perhaps techniques developed in connection with that are applicable in this context as well. So we want to say that we are passing through maybe two rational subspaces but not three uh, upstairs. So maybe that will work. So this is a problem over a function field. But over a number field, you simply have no ideas how to uh, approach K3, strength Picard is one, you have very, very little geometry to play with. And so then we thought, well, maybe, um, you know, okay, so here let me sketch uh, the proof of a theorem uh, in for special K3s, elliptic K3s. Um, so the statement is that the points are dense and how did it work? Well, we have an elliptic K3, and we already know, uh, or let's say we proved that we have infinitely many rational curves. Well, some of those curves will be multi-sections. Not all can sit in singular fibers, there are infinitely many curves. Well, uh, rational curves do have infinitely many rational points, and they will intersect infinitely many fibers. I mean, yeah, well, and then these points in those fibers, they, well, maybe they are of infinite order in the fibers. And so this way you can, generate more points, and it works. But you have to make sure that the rational curves that you're looking at are not, so to speak, torsion, that what they induce in the fibers are not torsion points. Well, this is some condition that needs to be checked. It's subtle, but it works. Yes. Dense after a finite extension of the ground field. So there is some finite extension of the rationals so that over that field the points are dense. Of course, yeah. Um, so. Now, we didn't know what to do in rank PCAR1, so, but we thought, well, maybe we can look at zero cycles of some degree. In other words, look at points and some extensions. We fix the degree of the extension, let's say quadratic extensions, other points dense there. Well, that means that we're looking at rational points on Hilbert schemes. Uh, well, and uh, uh, so we have uh, a theorem that if we have a polarized K3 of any degree, then uh, you can, well, I don't know whether I wrote the correct end here, uh, then, uh, yes, uh, on some symmetric or some Hilbert scheme, rational points will be potentially dense. Um, so, for example, if you have a K3 of degree 2 times a square, then already um, on HILP2, rational points will be potentially dense. And so what's used here? Well, we use that idea of Yao Zaslow that was then also developed by Bouville. Uh, we use this abelian vibration. I mean, I don't know how, well, we, we were aware of this paper, but uh, uh, so an abelian vibration is sort of an analog of an elliptic vibration. So what we need here, of course, uh, we need multi-sections. Now this time around, we don't find rational surfaces that could surface multi-sections, but uh, there are, 
uh, nevertheless surfaces with uh, uh, many rational points on them potentially mm, and we can make these surfaces from uh, in fact uh, elliptic curves genus one curves on the underlying k3 surface and then uh, propagate the points that you obtain in this way but this is really all we had and uh, well so for many years we were working sort of on other things but uh, so the big success of drive uh, algebraic geometry, if you like, uh, uh, you know, led us to think about applying some of the techniques, at least, in the setup of uh, K3 surfaces. All right, so there's this notion of derived equivalent K3 surfaces. And, uh, uh, well, there are many definitions. So one would be uh, the orthogonal complement of Picard groups, the transcendental lattices are isomorphic as uh, hot structures. Well, equivalently, there is some definition in this language, in the language of derived categories. There is some object in the bounded derived category of the product, so that the corresponding functor here is an equivalence of triangulated categories. So I want to say that it actually works over any field. You can write down the definition of derived equivalent case three over any field, and there is a paper of Yao, Oguiza, and others where you can count the number of derived equivalent case threes, let's say, like PCAR1. So let's look at some examples. You see, in high rank Picard, uh, when the Picard lattice is big, the transcendental lattice is small because you know, they have to fit into Z22. And uh, therefore, in high rank Picard, derived equivalence uh, you know, tends to imply uh, isomorphism. And so if you don't actually get anything new, it's sort of the same. So for example, if rank Picard is at least 12, or if the K3 has an elliptic vibration with a section, or if rank Picard is at least three, and the discriminant of uh, the Picard is um, cyclic. Now, so let me give you some examples here uh, of, uh, I think that's the lowest degree example of derived equivalent, but not uh, isomorphic uh, case threes. So we look at these lattices, two lattices, and uh, we look at case three surfaces where the Picard groups have, I mean, are these lattices. Uh, and split means over the ground field, right? There is no Galois action anymore on the lattice. This is what we have over the ground field. And so then the hope is maybe, you know, there is some relation between arithmetic properties of these K3s. So let's try to explore that. So, well, first of all, both have zero cycles of degree one, both of these over any field. Uh, the first one actually always has rational points, again, over any field. And that happens because we have smooth rational curves on uh, that surface, um, which, uh, in, which intersect with, well, which have odd degree cycles. Intersect hyperpolarization polar, polarization and odd, odd, de odd degree. And therefore, a rational curve with an odd degree cycle has to be a P1. So not only do we have points, we have actually two P1s full of points, infinitely many points on these P1s. Well, the other K3, uh, in fact, has infinite automorphisms over some extension of the ground field, and so it has a potentially dense set of rational points. Uh, what we don't know, however, is that first of all, the first one, which has infinitely many rational points, has potential density, that is, you know, the risky density over some finite extension of the ground field. We don't know that. And we do not know that the second one, which has potential density, has actually points over the ground field, even though it has a zero cycle of degree one over the ground field. So this is kind of a curious situation. And this would be sort of the first, maybe, test case of our hope that, uh, well, maybe we can bootstrap some geometry and from one case to another case. So what I'm describing here is a joint work with Brandon Hassett uh, from this year, and the paper is on my web page. Um, so, all right, so assume we have derived equivalent K3 over a field of characteristic not equal to two. Well, then there are Picard uh, 
uh, groups are actually stably uh, isomorphic as uh, Galois Kibauer K modules. They are not isomorphic. I mean, I've just shown you two rank two Picard rooms, which are not isomorphic. But if you add uh, Galois and various things, there are, they are. And the other thing of relevance in arithmetic geometry, Brouwer groups. So you may have heard of Brownian abstractions, Brouwer groups. So Picard and Brouwer groups has a invariants that play a role in arithmetic. So in, it turn, well, the Brouwer groups are the same um, in, in, all, in both cases. So well, again, we can hope to relate the arithmetic. And uh, then there is the results that if you have a zero cycle of degree one on one of the K3s, you also have a zero cycle of degree one on the other K3. And actually, it's more general. If you have zero cycle of any degree, then of this degree, then you'll have a zero cycle of that degree on the other side as well. So the index is preserved under derived equivalence, if you like. Um, all right, so what do we know about finite fields? Uh, well, there is a result from 2011 that if you have two derived equivalent K3s over a finite field, then they have the same number of points. In particular, if one has points, then the other has points. Now, what do we know over the real numbers? Um, well, if you have derived equivalent K3s over real numbers, then actually the, those manifolds are diffeomorphic, and in particular, one has points, the other has points. So the natural question is, what happens over the p-adics? And well, finally, what happens over Q? So the hope is that over p adics you have the same property. Then the next hope is, well, therefore, the delic points are sort of the same. The delic points are the same. You could look at the Brouwer kernel, and the Brouwer groups are the same. The, uh, the computation of local invariants, you can also relate them. Then the Brouwer kernels would be the same. And then there's a conjecture of Skorbogatov that, let's say, rational points are dense in the Brouwer kernel. In any event, you sometimes expect that you know, the Brouwer kernel does capture you know, a lot of arithmetic. So the hope, therefore, would be that over the rationals as well, if one has points over the rationals, the other has points over the rationals. But it's just a hope, it's not even a conjecture. So um, now, what about the p-adic case? Uh, so here is the theorem. Assume that uh, we are looking at derived equivalent K3s over a p-adic field of residue characteristic 7, or for technical reasons, and assume that uh, both admit ADE reduction. right? So we are now looking at mixed characteristic. Then if one has points, then the other has points. And uh, um, now just a comment. You see, having potentially good reduction turns out to be a draft invariant. So there's a recent paper by Matsumoto from 2014, literally months ago, uh, where he looks at, um, at this property of draft equivalence. But for example, we don't know whether or not having an ADE reduction is a draft invariant, even that, which would be a natural thing to suppose. Uh, well, not knowing you know, what to do with the periodics for now, so let's focus on the geometric case. So we have a family of K3s over a disk. Um, and uh, well, we don't always have a section. We don't always have rational points over this field. So here is an example of a family without, without a section. So then you'd like to ask, uh, does having a section, you know, is, is this a draft invariant? You know, if you have a draft equivalent K3, one has a section, should the other have a section? Draft invariant of the family? Yes, so K3 over a functional field. If you are, if you are draft over that, over that field, over that field, so I, I will talk about you know, what happens with draft equivalent, yeah, integrally, but, um, uh, now, so how do we think uh, about this? Well, we know that after some finite base change, there is something called the Kulikov model. I don't know, Weierstrass model. a nice model of a K3, the generation, which could be either a K3 surface or uh, this, you know, type two. I like to think of this as a towel. You know, you have rational surfaces at the ends and then tick, 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 you know, other surfaces in between. Or, uh, soccer ball, I guess, uh, a union of rational surfaces, combinatorial triangulation of a sphere. So there are these three cases, and you know, they're well studied. 
And so here, um, there's sort of a technical lemma. Assume that we have x and y derived equivalent over the field. Uh, and uh, suppose x admits a Kulikov model without base change right, over that field. Well, then y also admits a Kulikov model. And both sets are non-empty. So you're guaranteed to have sections, of course. Now, uh, the, the non-trivial part is, well, there is this base change involved. You know, how do you get the Kulikov model to begin with? And so here, I uh, just want to discuss one case of, um, you know, one case that happens. Um, so suppose we have some cyclic group uh, that uh, acts on a K3 surface via some quotient, another cyclic group, H, and that group is in the automorphisms of a K3, right? So then we can look at sort of an isotrivial family. You know, take a product on the first, on the, on, on delta 2, this group G acts simply via nth roots of 1. And on here, it acts by this subgroup of the automorphisms. And then we get sort of a twisted family, and we can look at you know, what happens here. Um, and uh, well, as you can imagine, you, know, you can do this in the draft equivalent context, and you will see the group actions you know, here and there. And so here is a lemma that, uh, well, we know when the, the quotient here, when this family has a section, it has a section if and only if the H action on X0 has a fixed point. All right. So now we have to analyze those fixed points. Um, now, um, the question then is, if you have you know, uh, a K3 surface and some finite cyclic group acting on it, and uh, another one, and suppose we, the action is compatible with an isomorphism of Hodge structures, does having a fixed point uh, on x0 you know, imply having a fixed point on y0, right? Completely down to earth. All right, so um, now what kind of cyclic automorphisms do we have on K3s? So uh, the Euler function of that has to be less equal than 20. And it turns out that all such n arise. Now, uh, and then you can look at uh, you know, those that preserve the two form, uh, you know, the symplectic ones. And in fact, uh, you know, the groups tend to be very small, so one lab to eight. I mean, you don't get very many symplectic ones. And uh, a lot of the fun is coming from the non-symplectic actions and the mixture of those. So I thought that I should give you a table of all numbers with or the function less than 20. Uh, as you can see, you can have quite interesting automorphisms, you know, 66 and 50. And the way uh, you should read this table is, well, if the automorphism is large, uh, then those happen to be unique. The K3s carrying such large automorphisms happen to be unique. I mean, in, rank, in high rank Picard as well. And there is an enormous literature, you know, classifying, you know, these particular K3s and, uh, so, in particular, you know, 66, 50, 44, 33, all of these are essentially one K3. And so, draft equivalence is not really that interesting for those. And then, when the action is very, very small, you know, symplectic, non symplectic, it's sort of also well understood. You can analyze the fixed points. And so, most of the fun is somewhere in the middle of this table. And then, again, there's a huge collection of papers. and. Uh, classifications and tables. You can have this fixed point locus and that fixed point locus. Um, and um, you know, some of the papers are recent: Artaban, Kium, Kondo, Machida, Nikul, and Oguza, Sarti, Taki. So many people looked at this, but there is no complete. I mean, no <laughs> simple answer that you can take off the shelf. And therefore, uh, I mean, this is still in progress. Hopefully. Uh, some combination of these papers, you know, intersection, you know, disjoint union, I don't know. I mean, some combination, because there are actually some contradictions. Some, I mean, there are papers that are inconsistent. Uh, but um, uh, still, you know, it, there is hope. So um, now, so here is a slide of, uh, you know, things to do. 
of course, we would like to have some mixed characteristic version of Kulikov models. I mean, it would be nice to know what happens if you work over the p-adics and you look at, uh, you know, the special fiber. You know, what happens? How can you relate? Um, you know, with derived equivalent K3s. And uh, naturally, you know, I think Ludmilla already brought it up. So there is uh, this uh, paper by Bridgeland Makhiosha that the Fourier Mukai transform of K3 families over curves, it specializes. And uh, again, it would be nice to have a mixed characteristic version of that for our applications. And it would also be important to explore what happens in the central fiber. I mean, they have just the results that says, you know, it specializes, but you know, what does it really mean for us? Um, and, uh, well, maybe in a sort of conclusion, so we know very little about rational points in general, rank PCAR1, K3s, um, over non-closed fields, even over, uh, you know, such fields as C double bracket T or the P-addicts, and these are, of course, you know, much more difficult function field or finite fields so of the rationals. And that we you know, now hope that techniques perhaps in uh, you know, Fourier Mukai transform derived algebraic geometry may shed some light on, the, on these arithmetic problems. Thank you. It's about practical part when you could layer algorithm, yeah. Actually, since there are some new algorithm which is for any variety given the equations in a, in a number of variables, mm -hmm. this, you can calculate your factors in linear time in prime numbers. Yeah. You know. yeah. Is it so what's implemented here is essentially linear time in for these case series. And um, yeah. I mean, you can do invaded projective spaces, hypersurfaces, invaded projective spaces. It's really, practical. it's really practical, yes. I mean, it still involves large matrices. I think here it's 200 times 200 matrices that he's processing, but it's okay. I mean, in many of them. Um, so, well, if you have your favorite case three, we're happy to compute. I mean, I, I forgot to say that that slide cost 120,000 hours of CPU time. You, you, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> CPU time is free. <laughs> Other questions? If not, let's thank you again.